Thank you, so and it's a pleasure. I hope you see. I tend to speak very fast. So I'm from New York City, and New York City they speak the fastest in the United States. And I have a lot to cover, so I'll speak even faster. So if you have difficulty understanding me, I speak up too much, just call it to my attention and I'll try to slow down. So as I said, I have a lot to cover. In the early part of the talk, especially, I'm going to go through very quickly. So just to give you a very, very brief, brief background, I began my career quite a while ago, in 1970. Oops, this, I have to use this. In Puerto Rico, I went there on vacation. I ended up getting a job doing exactly what I went there on my vacation for, so I spent seven years. So it's a pretty great way to start a career as a biologist. Whoops. And just in, in, in the 1970s, Puerto Rico had no, there, there weren't any biologists or ornithologists. So during my seven years there, just to again, give you a sense of what I did, I found just 15 species of birds that had been introduced to Puerto Rico that nobody even knew occurred on the island. And in the end day, I found both of those species of birds Living birds in Puerto Rico that nobody knew even occurred there. So, just to kind of show how little was known about the bird life. That bird was a new species of wobbler, a friend of mine discovered um, in 1973. On land, almost every year or every other year, some new species of bird, amphibian, reptile was discovered, or some thought to be extinct animal was rediscovered. That's the Puerto Rican parrot. At that time, there were only 13 left in the world. It was one of the rarest birds in the world. And I point these things out just to show you the picture on the right. No one cared. So it's the story of Puerto Rico. It's the story of India. It's the story of most of the world. And of course, my job, there are several ways to look at your job. My job in the beginning was, hey, find to learn about the birds of Puerto Rico. But learning about the birds of Puerto Rico doesn't save the birds of Puerto Rico. So learning about something is one thing, saving it is something else. But I was having the time of my life discovering new discoveries and trying to figure out how to actually take those discoveries and convert them into saving something. And on the right, you'll see, if you can see, I don't know if you can see in the back, we have the same kinds of problems every place has. Garbage, open garbage dumps, copper mining, superport. They wanted to build a superport and a spectacular site escape monkeys, rhesus macaques, the same uh, native monkey to here, escape there and were causing all kinds of problems, uncontrolled development. This is familiar all over the world. That's a, a look, the Caribbean monk seal became extinct in the 1950s. Um, again, just to give you a sense of the world is the same everywhere. And the United States, it was the same. So this is the ivory billed woodpecker that's probably extinct every few years. There's a new report that it still survives. Um, and the United States, Puerto Rico had the same kinds of problems, except Puerto Rico's were worse. So I did the things people do. I had a chance to write a book. The, uh, the first guide to Puerto Rico, the birds of Puerto Rico and the Virgin Islands. Wrote man I wrote their first endangered species list for Puerto Rico, management plans, you name it. Except it was all very frustrating. None of these strategies worked. This is an endemic iguana that's found only in Puerto Rico. So seven years of having the time of my life, trying to save wildlife, um, but nothing was really working. So what happened? 40 years later, after a whole career, I spent 30 years with the Fish and Wildlife Service. The entire 30 years I was with, I'm retired now. The entire 30 years, I spent doing international conservation work. 12 of those with Latin America and the Caribbean, and then 18 in the rest of the world. So I had a chance to see projects everywhere. When I retired, we were spending $20 million a year on conservation grants. Those grants, some of those grants were for tigers, some of them were for Asian elephants, um, some of them for rhinos, and a lot of them came to India. So I had a chance to learn lessons everywhere. 
And I found out there is an answer. And here's where the, here's where the answer is. It's in India. It's not in the United States. Why India? So why do they pick India? Because there are, I mean, there are over 200 countries in the world. And I wanted to compare, I mean, in the United States, where, of course, I was, that's where I was doing my conservation work, I wanted to have a place that I can compare where there was a slam dunk argument for why what I believe conservation was all about, where I could demonstrate it. And here's why you can demonstrate it in India. One is the comparisons are very stark, which we'll go into. Indies had a sophisticated culture for centuries for which for millennia. And one of the things that happens in the United States is there's a huge disrespect from indigenous cultures. So if an indigenous culture says something, people in the US just say, oh yeah, well, of course they're they're Indians or you know, they're indigenous people. What do you expect? They you need it because they die if they don't save the resource. That is not the case in India. So it's well developed for a long time. It has substantial size. It's not some little island like Puerto Rico. It's not some little microcosm. It's things that are populated. So you couldn't say, oh, the population is so sparse. It's easy to say, well, I like when no one lives there. So that argument couldn't be used. And India has impressive wildlife. And some of the same wildlife as the United States. So that's why I was especially interested in India, because India was, I felt successful. In wildlife conservation, you don't have these traits. Is this, can you hear me with this? So how does it, I did the first time I came to India, it's gotta be 20 something years ago. I was flabbergasted at the wildlife that was here. I mean, I was stopped in New Delhi, uh, the first time I landed, I was in New Delhi. You have five foot fruit bats, five foot wing spread fruit bats flying over New Delhi. That does not happen everywhere. In many places, those would be eaten instantly or shot because uh, they feel big because they're feared. So, but here is a Western world. How do people that I work with in the United States perceive India? Well, here's the perception of India air pollution, greater pollution, and so they write it off. Which is not what I see in India. So here's the reality that I saw. Let's start with looking with birds. All right, birds are my specialty. These are the nine extinct birds of the United States. So the United States has existed since time relation, they said almost exactly 400 years ago. During those 400 years, these nine species have become extinct. The ones I marked in red, we're very heavily hunted. And I'll go through them, I'll try to go through them quickly because we don't have a lot of time. So one is the grand owl. This was a flightless bird. It's sort of like a northern penguin. It's like a penguin, but it lives in the north. Couldn't fly like that, like that in 1944. It was ever written that that was used as a, for wax and things like that. It's a terrible, terrible history. Passenger pigeon. This is one of the most amazing because this was the most common bird in all of North America, perhaps in the entire world. So they believe there were billions, not tens of millions, but billions of passenger pigeons. So that's its range. Again, I won't go through all of this, but this bird was wiped out in 1914, the last bird by the zoo. Eskimo calling. You don't even see its range. It nested in the Arctic, flew down all the way to Argentina, had an unbelievable migration. When it migrated through the Midwest, you can't see it well, but it's gray, the gray area in the middle part of the United States. It was very heavily hunted. And that was wiped out. So we'll see over 200 million birds killed per year. Eskimo curlies, gone a few decades into the 20th century. Sort of like a chicken, a native chicken occurred to, but it was part of the eastern United States, was wiped out in the 1930s. Actually, the last thing that died in the 1930s was about 
15 miles from where I live today. Carolina Parrot Beat, the only parrot and the only North American parrot. Across the entire eastern United States, beautiful, beautiful bird, exterminated in the early 1900s. Yeah, feathers were used for hats. Uh, it was a nuisance to agriculture, so it was killed as a pest. Again, I won't go through the details, but it was a very important bird throughout the eastern United States. All right, what about India's extinct birds? So India has been around civilized country for about 5,000 years. If you have an extinction rate the same as the United States, the United States has lost this one species every 50 years. We have 350 years of whatever we have of uh, history. You have 5,000. You should have about 100 extinct birds in India at that rate. Here's your extinction rate, one. So it has one extinct bird, and they don't even know that it became extinct. It wasn't hunted, uh, not heavily hunted, and uh, it became extinct relatively recently. I didn't have a chance to spend any of the time to spend there's actually a duck on the list from the United States that has the same kind of history as the pink-headed duck. No one really knows, doesn't know much about it, and it disappeared. So this is a one extinct bird from India. So you scratch your head, say, how can this be? This is impossible. Well, maybe it's because the birds that became extinct in India became extinct millennia ago, 4,000 years ago or 2,000 years ago, and there were no records. So that's a good excuse for why perhaps all the extinctions were very early and there was no record of them. But except that it was more civilized than that. So you know, your civilization goes back to the but it's a, it's a recorded history. So it'd be very strange for a whole bunch of birds to disappear that you really don't know disappeared. That's just not very likely. But let's say that might have happened. So let's look at some more conspicuous animals. Whoops. Oh, here's a summary of the intervening extinctions. Nine in the United States, one in India. All right, so let's look at predators. You can list predators. So these are the predators in the United States. These are the predators in the field. You need to be a scientist to know that the predators in the are much, much, much more dangerous than the predators in the United States. But I'll, I'll try to go through them. I'd like to go through them quickly because I want solutions rather than the problem. Gray wolf. Gray wolf occurs in India as well as the United States. So that's a perfect comparison. Gray wolf was wiped out in the United States, deliberately wiped out. People were paid to travel all over the country to kill gray wolves. So by the 1930s, there was not a single gray wolf in the whole lower 48 states in the United States. They were still in Alaska, but Alaska, Alaska was completely inaccessible in the 1930s. Interestingly mm -hmm. enough, in the 1990s, the United States spent a lot of money, millions of dollars, Introducing the wolf because of the Endangered Species Act. So they introduced the wolf in Montana and it prospered. It prospered to the point where it started leaving the protected areas that it was put in. Once it started leaving those areas, the states wanted to kill them. And as you'll see on that list in 2021, the state of Montana expanded hunting to include baits, traps, snares, and uh, things to strangle wolves. So it's Yellowstone National Park. In some places, it's as good as dead. There's also a wolf in the southeastern United States called the red wolf. It's a small wolf. Again, I'm not going to go through it. I'll just leave you the highlight, which is there are 20 wolves alive today in the wild, only because they had a huge reintroduction effort that, that failed. So there are 20 red wolves in the wild, at, at, probably at most. Grizzly bear is in better shape. Again, I'm not going to spend much time on it. We could spend the oil there just talking about things. So there are a few thousand surviving today. So I mean, a few thousand, but over a thousand, I mean. Mountain lion, a very adaptable parent. Mountain lions occur from Canada to Argentina. They can live really in anything. And they're not really terribly dangerous. They might kill one jar, one, a few dogs, and 
maybe I'm going to be a solitary jogger, maybe 20 years. Then you still occur in every state in the United States. Now they're only found in limited areas of the West. All right, let's look at India. The most famous predator, the tiger. Of course, in this public that half the tigers are more that exist in, in the world today. So it's been eliminated for most of the countries where it occurred. Three fourths of the remaining tigers occur in India. Four million people live in the Indian reserves where tigers survive. Which, by the way, in the United States, my agency has 500 and close to 600 reserves, protected areas for wildlife. And we didn't allow one person to live in them. Not one person, maybe one person, but I wouldn't know who that would be. And yet we still have trouble saving wildlife, which is we'll get to in a few minutes. Your reserves have no fences. Many tigers leave the reserves. And from 1876 to 1912, 30,000 people in India were reportedly killed by tigers. So it's not a very friendly predator to have around people. In 2019, 85 people in India were killed by tigers. Because I found the most interesting statistic, or certainly one of the most, in the 1920s, when India's population was the same as the population of the United States today, 200 million people, those 300 million were living up to 30,000 and 100,000 wild tigers, which is pretty impressive. And the decline, now that you have so few in India, is not necessarily because of local persecution. It's a lot of it had to do with foreign trade, interest in skins and uh, international trade in, in tigers, which is fundamental, of fundamental importance. Leopard, another tremendous predator. No tourists for killing both humans and livestock. Again, the United States has no predator even close to a leopard. So I have some statistics, how many people they killed, and so on and so forth. It's a pitch for foreign demand. So I'm not going to go through the predators because we just don't have time. But you get the picture of what I'm trying to say. And the, the book is very important. I mean, considering not only human history, but 150 years of colonization by Indian, which loves to hunt. And of course, Right, technical right to field lands. 300 lands killed by one officer, British officer, during the colonization by the Brits. It's a miracle you have some of these animals left. The cheetah, of course, you now we're introducing cheetah. But they sort of were loved to death rather than persecuted to death. And there's a big difference between loving something to death, a Raja man to have hundreds and hundreds of cheetahs in his collection rather than going out and persecuting an animal. So it's not the same thing. And interestingly, I mentioned that you have the gray wolf, the same gray wolf that's in the United States. Look at the statistics for the gray wolf. It is unbelievable. 60 children killed from 1993 to 1995, just in this one state of India. We haven't had a person killed by any predator or any, any wolf in the United States since probably the 1800s. One person was killed by a wolf in the United States. I guarantee you they passed legislation to wipe out the animals that they've been introduced there. So despite this mortality by wolves, there's never been heavy persecution of wolves in India. All right, so we looked at the predators. Well, let's look at herbivores. The biggest herbivore in the United States is the American bison. There used to be about 40 million bison running around the plains of the United States. They were reduced to about 100 animals in, in, in around 1900. And then you know, there were a few tens of thousands. So that is an animal that has, I mean, when you compare to 40,000 bison, is not very many, but it has been at least uh, restored a bit. What is the biggest urban in India? Asian elephant. It, not even close to a comparison to the American bison, which is virtually homeless. It's like a wild cow. The threat of Asian elephant 
the crops and people you know better than I do. How can you do your best per year? It's estimated from what I've done the family in the future, and yet you still have 30,000 Asian elephants wandering all over India. And again, what is the greatest threat? It's not the local people, it's poaching for their tusks. And that's some of the damage that Asian elephants do, no American bison could possibly do that. So, India has far more dangerous wildlife. Their survival is dramatically more better than the predators in the United States or, or major herbivores. Local persecution, uh, amazing precipitation, and the timings of conflict. So, what does it teach us? That's what we want to get to. So, when I go to school to learn how to do things, and of course, with conservation biology, where you really want to use what are the things, what are the tools that we need, that we need in order to conserve these animals, because we're really doing a very good job of it. So, let's look at some of the most fundamental variables that we feel are necessary for conservation money, you can't do anything without money. Space. If you have no space, where are these animals going to live? Population size of 13 million people. If you're going to negatively impact wildlife, the fewer the people, better chance for the wildlife to survive. The ratio of the civilization. If you've only been a long time, you can't wipe things out. But if you've been a for a long time, there's much more chance that you're going to eliminate critters. And the availability of habitat, of course, that's related to population, human population. And of course, everybody's favorite, we need to do science. Without science, you can't save anything. That's an absolute necessity for conservation. And without solid laws, how do you possibly save anything if you don't have really powerful legislation with peace? Because then people, uh, if you don't have that, people won't do what they should do, and you can conserve anything without good legislation. And yet, what good is good legislation if you don't have law enforcement? You could pass the greatest law in the world, but if you don't enforce it, it doesn't make any difference. So, I mean, these are the things that make conservation work. And then there's culture. What are our cultural values? What do we believe about what we like? That's certainly a factor. So let's really look at them a little closer. And let's compare the United States and India. Who has more money? India, right? Oh, no. No, it's the United States. That's right. We're rolling in money. So the United States, the methods of it, the United States has a variable for conservation. We probably, I mean, no one's diagnosed and I put the numbers together, but it would be astronomically more. I can guarantee you that. My agency alone, which probably many of you have never heard of, has a today a billion dollar a year budget. A billion dollars. One of those where you know, we know we're about 10 years ago, it was only 1.6 billion dollars. And that was just one small agency within the government. Size, India. How big is India compared to the United States? It's only one quarter the size of the United States. So it's not like you have a lot more territory to save your wildlife. So space obviously is important, but India doesn't have it. I don't think we have to talk about population size. That's been in the news all for the last few weeks about India being the most popular country in the world. So there's uh, the population in the United States is four times less than India's. Out of, kind of, of habitation. India's been around 10 times longer, more than 10 times longer than the United States in terms of being populated by a, civil, by a, a strong civilization. So, look at that availability. We can't raise that ground. Obviously, the United States has more habitat. The whole western part of the United States is not heavily inhabited. Legal frameworks. The United States has the Endangered Species Act, Clean Water Act, Clean Water Act, Environmental Protection Act, those acts coming out of their rules. And so, arguably, 
somebody having done a comparison, but the likelihood is the United States has stronger legal frameworks. Law enforcement, I'm sure we could get a general consensus that law enforcement in the United States is much better than in India. And here, everybody's favorite, science. We've got to do science or we can't conserve wildlife. How could you possibly conserve anything until you know something about it? Well, we have 80,000 environmental scientists in the United States, and I can guarantee you they don't know much about saving wildlife. So that's a myth. So that was the big Because of all the things we saw, the United States has all of its advantages. And it ultimately comes down to cultural values. Why do have beliefs? I mean, you include that all living, all living things have a soul. That everybody doesn't believe this, but it's certainly a lot more um, prominent than in the United States where nobody believes it. No species has a right to interfere with the rights of another. We're both of an enemy, a bird as a, you can be, as a, whether a bird or an insect or some other form. And I've got a consequence meaning you know, you know, if you know, you know, you know, you know, that the time that's not of any great significance here, but it, it is, it is of significance. Uh, so uh, here's a, a fundamental example. This fascinated me early on when we first came to India. I live right next to a huge uh, tidal marsh. I've lived there for almost 10 years. I think I've seen three mosquitoes because this is the United States view of how to treat insects. And interestingly, I discovered, in, especially in southern India, this is a very prominent process of the colon, making the colon, which has respect for insects. And it just shows the tremendous uh, difference in how even small critters are perceived. There are several colons. So look at these factors. These are the nine factors we've gone through. So the United States has an advantage on order, and India has an advantage on one. And what can we do from that? We saw that India's major predators, their largest, largest herbivore, everything is better conserved than India. Everything is better conserved. We saw that in science, space, laws, None of those compensate or counterbalance the impact of cultural values. Which means that cultural values from absolutely all of these other things that conservation, Western conservation, perceives as fundamental. So, I mean, we can debate this if you'd like. There's really not a lot to debate because the facts are pretty clear. It's just people choose not to look at them. So let's look at conservation differently. Well, before we get into some of the what we can learn from all of this, I sort of I asked the question. I don't know how many of you from the this famous boat, but the, one of the famous Stories in the United States is the pilgrims. They were the first colonists. They really weren't, but yeah, they were more or less the first colonists. They came in the Mayfair, they landed, and there's this famous place called Plymouth Rock. They've got a big memorial around it. And the pilgrims came in the United States in 1620. So I asked the question what if rather than pilgrims being in the Mayflower, what if pilgrims were? Well, all those extinct birds almost certainly would still be in the United States. I don't think the United States would have a single extinct species, not a bird. I think all the predators in the United States would be in dramatically better shape. And why isn't it recognized? In the United States, we have a tremendous amount of internal conflict racial conflict, political conflict, but on top of that, we have a tremendous disrespect for other cultures. 
So we have disrespect other cultures in our own country. It's even easier to disrespect cultures within some other country that we don't know much about, which is another whole discussion. And actually, it would be pretty enjoyable to talk about why this is the case, but we're a very introverted country that just doesn't have respect for the rest of the world. We have all the answers. And also because of the bias towards biological sciences, which is another whole, I need have a chance to talk about it on Monday. Uh, but um, there's a reason for it, but it's an obsolete priority. Conservation is a social science. Also, sort of with an interest in bias, not only in the United States, States, but Western Europe, is a very real, still very real colonial. The, you know, colonialism in the sense of putting the flag in the country is over. All of these countries are independent, but the mindset hasn't changed. So there's a tremendous residual you know, colonialism in the way the developing treats other countries, which also would be a, a, an interesting discussion. And the thing is that the residual group which has a residual effect in the, in the countries that were, did the colonizing, and it has an effect in the country that was colonized. I lived in the Caribbean where slavery was rampant, and a lot of people in the Caribbean still have a mindset that have, has not gotten in past the terrible uh, negative consequences of slavery, as sad as that might seem. Another factor is conservation training for professionals, people like myself. I got a PhD in ecology. I showed you the birds. I studied some of those birds. I did my PhD work on. It was wonderful fun. I made unbelievable discoveries. It was worthless for conservation. Conservation and studying animals are two different things. And so people are not trained to be effective conservationists. And of course, you say, oh, cultural values matter. Well, how do you call it, quantify cultural values? Isn't it easier to go out and count how many, speak, how many individuals of some lizard are in a, in a habitat or certainly a lot more fun? And uh, so, or how many hectares? Oh, what are, what's better than how many you have hectares of weapons you set aside and, and conserve? But we, we conserved a thousand hectares this year. Well, I mean, donors love that stuff. But they, how do you say, oh, gee, we increase people's cultural sensitivity, how do you measure that? And you become more and more measurement oriented. So well, that's why this is not recognized. Now I'm going to go into solutions. But before I do that, if people have any questions about what I've done, uh, said so far, I'll take a minute or two questions. Anybody have a question or a comment? Okay, good. I'll go in with the uh, solutions. So solution number one, we really need to know what the, what the values of communities are. It's sort of like you ask a biologist about conserving a lot of resource, then you say we need to study it first, right? If they send you to some island somewhere and you said, hey, Joe, you know, we need to save this animal. You say, how can we save it? We need to move to the rock and the little car. And you tell them that, you know, I can't save it. That is not so. What you need to know is how the people treat that animal. Because if you know what the communities think, you'll know whether the animal is going to survive or not, whether it's common or not, and so on. So you have to know what a community's values are. And then what a community's values are is equivalent to what we've done in the past, which is learning what, as much as we can about the species. If you don't know what a community thinks, then frankly, it's very hard. It's going to be very hard. I mean, you might be lucky. I mean, they're very, they're very conscious towards wildlife, but that you're, that you're, that's your you're only guessing. I won't go into this because things get complicated. Once you start talking to experts and values and things like that, they're going to say, oh, yes. But when somebody has a value, it doesn't mean it's going to change their behavior. So there's this immense literature on how people have certain values, but they do something that's completely against their own values. Which you say, oh, you scratch your head, that's not true. Actually, if you think about it, we will do it. So there's something we believe in, but it's sort of not fun to implement. And so we go a different route because it's just not the way, it's just not comfortable to us. 
And so that's actually a very common practice. So converting values into behavior is technically a whole field unto itself, which we're not going to talk about. But uh, it's one of the things, you know, the red flags people raise to the issue of, of dealing with values. But the bottom line is, it's not a reason not to deal with values. It just makes dealing with values tougher. So we need to identify a few of these values. Um, and, and these are things that we as individuals can do. And since we don't have a lot of time, I'm not going to go into them. I'm just going to quickly say one individual can make a difference. And uh, there was a fellow that happened in this little town in Connecticut. And uh, fascinating enough, this little town, it's just a few minutes, 50 minutes from New York City. Um, it's called Deep River because it has a deep port on the river. And so larger boats could dock there. And so they were able to develop an industry there. What industry was that? An industry of producing things out of ivory, piano keys, combs for women's hair, that type of thing. This buying out of ivory, uh, certainly in the United States. Where does ivory come from? Well, in the United States, it came from African elephants. That's what an African elephant camp driver looks like. What happened was this one fellow, who was a retired fellow, who wasn't a biologist or anything, and the game had had like a hundred year history of using ivory for making things. And he said, you know what? We owe something to the elephant. And to make a long story short, this town passed a resolution, probably the only resolution in the entire United States, saying we have done something very sad and if you go to the African elephant and create a resolution saying we're going to contribute to helping conserve the African elephant. And this guy single little dude did this and uh, we completely reversed what was the philosophy of the town historically. Now, of course, they're no longer the harvesting elephants, which we had made or using elephant tusks. But nevertheless, it was a very, very impressive accomplishment by a fellow um, who, as I said, just found it, found it important and worked on it. So I'm going to mention community. We'll talk about communities and stakeholder groups. And what I'm talking about when we refer to community is any, any group that we're part of. It could be uh, an age group. It could be an organization that does things that we like, all kinds of groups. And, and it could be, of course, a unit, a town, or a state, or a country. And so I'm using the, a community in a very broad, uh, broad sense. And of course, we're going to book most of you who are into professional community, which uh, is, is very important. So, again, for lack of time, um, I've touched on this. Why well, bother, bother to do it? Because you need to know where people are, where people are coming from. What's involved in finding that community's values? Well, you know, it's just not very different than finding you doing a survey. Doing surveys are a very good way. Whoops. Did I do that? I think it went well. It went well. Um, I'm not doing anything. Next <laughs> uh, <laughs> right. one. So what's what's fundamentally involved? You know, you can go around by yourself and do a census easily, but it's reaching a consensus. It's how do you bring people that have community together and reach consensus about what you believe? And that doesn't have to be a huge debate. 
because different things tend to float to the top. The things that the majority of the community believes in will tend to float to the top. Obviously, if it's a professional community, a community of like-minded people, it's going to be a lot easier to identify values than in a very diverse community. The more diverse, the more challenging. And obviously, as you go up in scale, from a town to a state to a country, identifying values becomes that much more challenging. Or the more reason why, it pays to start small. You start small, you learn how to do it, and then you transfer it to different scales. It's just like uh, you wanted to survey some bird, it's easier to serve, survey it locally than it is in an entire country. Fundamentally, if it's done right, the process is as important as the result. Why? Because a lot of times, in most communities, there isn't a lot of communication. There's not a lot of cross-fertilization. There's not a lot of discussion. And so the simple process of talking about values creates trust and, and uh, relationships within the community, which, as I say, in many cases doesn't exist. So if the process is done right, that's actually can be more important than the result of finding out what the actual values of the community are. And I'd love to be able to give you more examples of that if there's time, but there isn't time for me to go into that now. This is just an example from the United States. You say, how do we do this? This city, Pittsburgh, was the biggest steel producing city in the United States in the 1800s. There were hundreds of steel mills all over the city. Now it was probably one. They're virtually gone. But it's a fairly large city, 500,000 to a million people. They've elevated the rights of people, the community and nature over corporate rights. That's an absolute miracle. So I think, well, how this happened, I don't really know, but it's incredibly impressive that it has. So it can be done, it just takes a focus. Now, very importantly, this is the United States, these numbers, the challenge of identifying values, not challenge of identifying, the issue of values is declining every year. The values towards the environment in the United States are on a steep downward slope. So we can we can won't go through this. I'll just take the first one. People were asked in 1996 how they felt about leaving the earth in better shape uh, for the for future generations. That's a simple value. Who in the world wouldn't want to do that? Well, in 1996, 74% of the country did. 74%, okay, that's three out of four. That's not bad. What happened by 2012? Only 34% believes in that. I mean, is that not unbelievable? What happened? And it's the case for every one of these environmental values. they have gone down, it's like a ski slope. You don't have skiing here in Bangalore, do you? Skiing? No, I didn't think so. <laughs> no, no, no kidding. That was a bad joke. Bottom line knows that if you look at this chart, you can't believe how values are have declined. So when you ignore them, and the conservation community ignores them, it doesn't mean that they're going to be sustained. So we'll talk a little bit about what's changing these values. All the things that we know influence all of our values. We grow up as little kids, our parents have the biggest impact on what we believe. Okay, great. Because none of this has changed. There's only one thing that's changed as far as I can see, and that's big business, the corporate sector. The corporate sector realized, gee, what makes people have certain values? Well, look at the numbers at the bottom. 1983, the corporate sector in the United States spent $4 on advertising for children during the course of a year. $4 per year. In 2010, it spent $1,500 per child in the United States. One move with the worst all that money. They're wasting money. They don't know that if they can change a little kid's values, they really can just change their parents' values. And then that's what stops smoking in the United States. That's what the, the problem is the corporate sector isn't terribly interested in conservation. They're interested in selling or something. 
And if kids want something, go ahead and get their parents to buy it for them. They don't buy it themselves. So well, we're moving a very influence towards buying, 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 and new stuff. I need more of this and I need more of that. That is not really very good for environmental values. And that, in my mind, is probably the biggest reason why the values are declining tremendously in the United States. All right. So we talked about identifying values. They want to be created and they want to be written down. They don't have to be made into law, but they need to be so that people can actually see them. So from just as an example, the Republicans, uh, a few decades ago, there was a fellow named Newt Gingrich who was in charge of the Republicans. He created the contract with America. I mean, doesn't that sound great? You don't know what's in the contract, but it sure sounds great. He packaged them. He didn't just create a system of here's what our party believes in, but he, he filmed them in a way that was attractive to people. So he created some kind of a charter. And then he has to be formal adopted. Framing. I can't emphasize enough. I'd love to tell you a whole bunch of stories about framing. But how much is framing has everything to do with whether it will be successful. I voted very quickly. There was a first thing called the Affordable Care Act. President Obama made this, got this legislation passed that said every poor person in the United States should have health care. Who can argue with that? Well, the Republicans can. And so instead of calling it the Affordable Care Act so that everybody can afford health care, they called it Obamacare. Obamacare, one third of the people in the United States don't know that Obamacare and the Affordable Care Act are the same thing. One third of the country. Because each party framed it differently. And the framing of the Affordable Care Act as Obamacare, we were along with the baggage that the act requires everybody to have insurance. It's telling you, you have to have insurance. And that impinges on your individual freedom. And who is the government to tell you what you should be doing with your money? And so 40% of the country hates the Affordable Care Act. I can guarantee you that 30% are the ones that need this health care the most. It all has to do with framing. So like I said, we could spend hours talking about that. Cola. Some of you probably drink Coke or Pepsi. I don't know how popular it is here. None of you, none of you drink the generic cola, I would expect. Why? Because Coca-Cola is spending billions of dollars a year to convince you that that's what that's the only kind of COVID you should drink. The billions of dollars that they spend a year is not wasted money. Coca-Cola is not going out of business. Why? You don't know how to frame the issue. So it isn't just having the right issue or the right value. It's how you package it. That sounds very business-like, but that's the way the world is. And so values have to be packaged just like Coca-Cola is packaged, just like the Affordable Care Act is packaged. So, a lot of people will say, oh, well, you are talking about environmental education. You know, that's valid. Well, environmental education and values are not the same thing, uh, but I'm not going to go into it. No, no time for this. So obviously, if you have values, once you identify them, you need to implement them, you need to monitor them. Solution four, this is fundamental. Stakeholder groups. Stakeholder groups, sectors of society. Population needs to focus on stakeholder groups. And I'll give you one or two powerful examples of that. You know what we do is we focus on species groups. What is the endangered? What are the most endangered species? What are the species that inhabit wetlands? What are the birds that migrate? If you look at the United States, we've got a, we've got an initiative for every single species group you could possibly imagine. We don't talk to one another. They each work in a total vacuum, but we have a species group initiative for everything. And I've been involved in most all of them. What we need to do is not the species groups, we need stakeholder groups. The groups of people, species groups, or other animals. So that's solution four, a change in focus. 
Again, I'm, I'm not, we don't have enough time to go into this because I'm going to spend a little bit of time giving you some examples. And the examples come from, well, okay, you're going to focus on the stakeholder group. What exactly are you going to do? How do you, you know, how do you make things happen? Well, you develop a cornerstone initiative. Now, I spent, I would say, 10 years trying to figure out what a cornerstone initiative should be. Because there's so many really good conservation initiatives. And many, many bad ones. I'll give you an example, and then I'll give you the sort of the criteria. So we had money to spend in Mexico. And then we sat down and we said, you know what? We have some extra money, about three hundred, five hundred thousand dollars $500,000. let us do some work with Mexico. Great. What should you work on? Well, we have a migratory bird train with Mexico. Why don't we pick some of the migratory birds and work on them? Well, didn't we just say you didn't start off focusing on the species? So we could have focused on the migratory bird. We could have focused on some shared endangered species. There's an endangered parrot that just goes over the border. We could have worked with Mexico. Mm -hmm. No, no. What we got is we work with four, four and five conservation groups in Mexico. Four and five groups. We sat in the room for three days. And we said, what is the stakeholder group in Mexico that is having the most negative impact on the wildlife? And reach. And who, who, what do you think that group was? Anybody? No, no. The politicians, right? So the politicians have all these effects. They're deciding on everything that's happening all over the country, except nobody can talk to them. Well, we said, okay, we're going to do a project on the politicians in Mexico. That's what we're going to do. And we formed a little coalition in Mexico that addressed it. And they couldn't figure out what to do. How in the world do you reach these powerful, powerful people? Well, the first thing they decided is not the agency heads, not the Secretary of Agriculture, the Secretary of Transportation. They change too often. They wanted to focus on legislative people, people, you know, in the legislature. Okay, well, that's great. But how do you reach them? It took a year, over a year, they wanted to figure out exactly how to reach them. And we know that they came up with the perfect answer. You know what the perfect answer is? If they want to do it. If they're on a boat, they can't leave. So the plan was to put them on a boat for five days, and you know, if you had the attention for five days, despite the fact that they wanted to do something else. So they put them on a boat, and put them on a boat, and take them to the Sea of Cortez. And the Sea of Cortez is going to visit these different environmental sites. Well, what do you know? If they were to actually put the legislators and put them on the boat, they got a phone call. Who called? Oh, it was only the president of Mexico. The president of Mexico wanted to know why they were taking these legislators to um, the Sea of Cortez. I'll go back two slides. They said, well, one of the sites we're visiting is Cabo Puno. And Cabo Puno on the left has this gigantic industrial complex that's going to be built there. And the president said, but is that project approved yet by my administration? And then organizers said, well, yeah, actually, it has been approved. So the president said, well, give me a few months before you take your trip. Before you take your trip. Within three months, that project was canceled. And they hadn't even selected the, they hadn't even selected the legislators yet for the project. And the president canceled this gigantic, multi, multi million dollar project. Something I think is absolutely impossible. I want to talk about I'll give it, uh, another example, which I'm mean, sure when it's in Lucia is uh, the St. Lucian parrot, but I don't think we have time to talk about it. Basically, they use the parrot as a spokesperson to young children, and they can bring the whole attitude of the island towards parrot conservation. So by using young children, just like with cigarettes, they able to get the attitudes of the entire populace to change towards parrot conservation. St. Lucia is going from having a little bit local parrots to having close to 2,000. So uh, I'm going to skip through another, I'm going to pass another example and get to the nuts and bolts of this. So, what is a cornerstone initiative? 
the focus on the stakeholder group. All right, I've said that many times. It addresses the root problem. It doesn't address some superficial problem or the symptoms addresses the root problem. It needs to be a long-term solution. And here's the most fundamental thing. And I can guarantee you this will happen to all of your careers. No matter what profession you're in, you're bombarded, bombarded with these everyday things, whether it's your opinions and filling in an opinions form or whatever, reports that you have to write, grants that you have to write. There are always everyday things that you have to do. And the greatest challenges, if you really want to conserve anything, is to try to move that aside and spend some time thinking about the future. <laughs> You have to think about the future and come up with a solution that addresses the future. Uh, uh, relating to that, I, I will go back just for a second because I, I can't help but do this. Protected areas of Mexico. In Mexico, they have over 600 protected areas. They have like a thousand employees that work on those protected areas. How are they trained? At best, they're taken for two weeks and given some training on how to manage your protected area. We said to Mexico, just like we did about the decision makers, we did the same thing for protected areas managers, because that was the second group that that meeting that we had where they identified who in Mexico needs, you know, has the biggest impact on conservation that they're not reaching. We said to Mexico, you know what? If you create a nine-month course, not two-week course, a nine-month course for your future conservation protected area managers, we'll give you X amount of money. He said, oh, really? That's a deal. So they formed this big task force. They created not a one-month course. They created a 14-month course. 14 months, way longer than we ever anticipated. And they said, and I said, we we'll realize your present managers don't have the time to take this course. This is for future managers. It's not only to the future. The present managers, they're busy as hell. They don't have time for anything. Let them do their jobs. But for the future, every future person we hire needs to go through this course. Mexico, after I created the course, was so excited about it, they enrolled all the existing managers to the course by distance learning. Unbelievable. That's what Queen of Stone we should absorb. And that's why we have to look to the future. Because if you focus on the present, which is how do we get the present protected area managers trained, you know what? You're never going to get them trained because they're only the time. You have to create something that reaches out into the future. So, option six democracy of conservation. The United States, as I've suggested, has a very population in a lot of ways. Um, and as far as our protected areas go, like I said earlier, no one's allowed to live in a protected area. Why? Well, because we think they're going to destroy it. That's an interest, interesting attitude. But yeah, the world's allowed the scientific community, the certain experts in the, in the agency, the state agencies, anyone we talk to, they always know better than the general public. Or if they know better than the general public, they don't even hear what the general public's opinion is, because after all, they know better, they're the ones that are well trained. And so, why would they want to listen to the general public, which knows nothing about the biology of some of these animals? The other thing that's unbelievably common is how groups, especially the big conservation organizations, the big conservation organizations, all they think about are the rich and powerful. And uh, they are the kind of rich and powerful, and their interest in grassroots, which doesn't generate money for them, is practically insignificant. So, um, and that doesn't even include the states. And I was, I was talking to Sid at lunch uh, about how the states in the United States are completely controlled by hunters, which is a whole other story. And so, hunters, 4% of the United States has is hunts, but they control 75% of the conservation money. That's not the democracy of conservation. Intervention, it's the same thing. And I'd like to be able to talk more about that, but uh, we didn't have the time. Solution seven, networking. This is a quote from Major Anderson and Matthew. The biggest problem facing the environment today is that the view and the house who are most immediately dependent on the concern with conservation and same management. He's talking about the professionals. 
He's talking about the professionals. And he has to about framing issues of Coca-Cola and how they rally around the theme. The conservation community in the United States is as fragmented as generic cola is. They barely talk to one another. They certainly didn't even fly around the theme. Every group has its own credit or its own attack, and they scarcely talk to one another. And that's generic cola, that is not Coca-Cola. And so no working, everybody likes to do it and think about it and think honestly, I think you're at the truth. You have miles ahead of anything uh, that is commonly done in the United States. So you're in the right place, but this is a big deal. So I talked about Coca-Cola. Uh, behind the right types of professionals. Again, something we could talk a lot, a lot, of, a lot about. But they need to be oriented. I mean, that is a big thing. The main thing you need to know is not that how to study the biology of the species, it's how to develop trust with other people. Working with teams, exciting verbal communication, collaborating in culturally diverse settings. This is the essence of what the future conservation professional needs to be. And it's virtually the opposite of the way most people in the United States are trained for being conservation professionals. I mentioned before how hunters dominate the landscape and the funds and the plan, the political plan for conservation. So this fellow, Michael Sula, a wonderful fellow, wonderful biologist, created the field of conservation biology. And that was a new way of conserving human life in the 1990s. But look at the name. It's conservation biology. It's not conservation sociology, it's conservation biology. Michael Soleil was a brilliant biologist, but he had no idea how to conserve species. I mean, uh, conservation biology, which still is very popular, is not the solution to conservation. But the real much time said, because I would. Yeah, all right. Um, I mean, very quickly, I want to very quickly give you this example from India because this was a, a little shock to me. As I said, when I was working for a service, we did a lot of work on tigers. And so uh, the first time I came to India, I think it was the first time, was it, anyway, it doesn't matter. I came to India for a big tiger. And there was a piece about the huge tiger since it had just been done in India. When it was a three-way conference, the first speaker was your environmental minister. And he actually I was a very impressive fellow. And he said, okay, the number of tigers in India is the same today as it was five years ago. So don't get too upset. We're talking about 2011. And he said, oh, by the way, there are some other things you should be aware of. India is going to be 6% economic growth in the indefinite future. That's going to have an impact on tigers. It has lost 10% of its tiger habitat. One third of the tigers are coming the outside of tiger reserves. So these were warnings that he was giving all the world's top tiger experts. That's what this meeting was. There were people from all over the world for this meeting. So, how much time did we spend in the next two and a half days discussing the commitment to 6% economic growth? Zero. Well, that's not too surprising because what in the world can conservationists do about economic growth? But what about the 10% loss of habitat? That's something you could talk about. How much time did we spend talking about the issue of tiger habitat? Zero. And what sure of tigers are coming outside the reserves? What an impact that has on people and communities. How much time did we spend talking about that? Zero. We spend the entire two and a half days talking about how to monitor tigers. Two and a half days talking about how to monitor tigers. I was ready to turn my hair out. That's amazing in my brain. Subsequent to that, we do another tiger event. So the World Bank funded a big project on recovery of tigers throughout the range. So I went through the document. See, well, what, is, what is the World Bank? What is each country's proposing for how it should solve their tigers? 
Reagan, Reagan was in 34%. Oh, it was mentioned 34 times in this document on who to save the tiger. Capacity building, helping local people. Of course, a lot of the rain states are as developed as India. And capacity building was mentioned 18 times. Public awareness. Ah, I don't have the number for public awareness. It was like a dozen times. Surveys and outreach, five times. Education, once. Cultural values, zero. Now well, I can guarantee if that's the strategy we use to save the tigers of the world, the tigers of the world are gone. I can guarantee they're gone. This is something. The first point up there, we did a survey in the United States. How many of you are the best at working with other people, making things with other people? Are you in the top 1%? Are you in the top one percent of people for making friends because you're so charismatic and tell so many jokes? Twenty-five percent of college students in the United States thought they were in the top one percent. It shows you how these things like developing trust. Oh yes, I'm good at that. I'm not necessarily. I want to talk about this. The final uh, solution is to do with adaptive management. And that is, you know, you need to learn from your mistakes which is something that we're not too good at. So the bottom line is, we have a lot of changes to make. We're in much time love with technology and new technologies, not enough with values. Every time a new technology comes along, we think it's the answer, it's not. So we need a major transformation. Thank you. Um, uh, so we can take a few questions now. Uh, Herb is going to be around for about four or five days with us, right? So you can always drop into his office. He sits in Kamal's room. Uh, next to the boardroom, but we can take about two questions now. I bet you have a lot of questions. Yes. <laughs> Hi. Uh, so my name is Chetan and I'm a PhD student here. Uh, my question is basically uh, when you were comparing uh, conservation outcome in US and India and you're uh, highlighting a lot about values. But you know, when we have a lot of values, there's a problem comes with values that uh, when there's a conflict between a tiger and person, who do we choose? Because in the US, that's a straightforward case, the case that, okay, uh, we choose human, there is no life gone because of some larger predator. But in India, you have given a lot of numbers and I'm sure, I mean, actual number might be higher. So how do you deal with that problem when we are talking about values? Because in past few years, just recent years, we have seen a lot of cases where values have actually this conflict between values, misplaced values and uh, misplaced conservation values and animal ethics has created a lot of conflict for people and animal both. Like if a tiger is killing somewhere, like sometimes, you know, politics of this delayed the necessary conservation action, which we have seen with tiger in the past few or couple of time in Maharashtra and Rajasthan. And because of the delay, a lot of human life has gone. And that uh, again, impact convincing people for conservation. I see, but I'm not understanding your question. No, so I'm saying when, uh, because, uh, I mean, what value will choose when there is a conflict between a tiger and a person? Because tiger is killing a lot of people there. And how do you make case for that, in that case, to save a tiger? That's the thing. It's not for us to choose the value. It's for the community to choose the value. And once you know what the community's values are, that helps you or us understand, well, this is a value that can work, that we can build, we can build on. Or well, cheapest, the value... You know, way over here, we need to be different. So, 
it, it all has to do with what the community, ultimately what's going to happen with a tiger that kills people is the community is going to decide and going to take some action. And as you know, in some places they'll kill it, in other places they might do something else. So you think in that case, alcohol uh, value system shift, shifted like that, like, okay, just imagine the community is thinking like US now, that human type is of top priority, then maybe uh, one day we may lose all the tiger. Well, if you don't talk about uh, community as well, uh, that is also problematic. So I can guarantee you the things values shift towards America's values with regard to tigers or anything, any wildlife, you're going to lose your wildlife. So in that case, we cannot live entirely on the community and entirely on the someone outside that community, right? That's right. Ultimately, someone outside for, for the outside the community cannot decide what the action is. So you know, you end the same complaints. Oh, in, in Delhi, in Delhi, you're making these decisions. When the community doesn't agree with the decision that the politicians make, then they're going to defy it and they're not going to follow it. And so those decisions, and that's why laws don't work. Is you pass a law and you think, oh, this is what we want. That's what the politicians want. But if the community doesn't want it, the laws don't work. And so it, it, it all comes down to the community. That's right. So in that case, the, even the uh, not properly enforced law is also a problem. Well, I, I would say a weak law, a weak law that, that does, says the right, that says what the community wants, that's a good thing. Then a powerful law that says if you do this, you're going to be you're going to have this fine, or you're going to be thrown in jail. Mexico tried that, but just as an example, Mexico adopted the U.S. approach to law enforcement. They said you break the law, you're going to jail, or you break the law, you're going to have to pay a fine. What happened? If it's against what the community values are, the people protest, and Mexico didn't have enough law enforcement people to deal with that. Plus, it created terrible relationships. So all they were doing were creating this resentment from one end of the country to the other. So they changed their law enforcement completely to say, no, no, we need to understand the community and integrate our law. It could be a weak law into what the how the into the community. Once we develop a trust and relationship with the community, we can start moving in the right direction. So like eating sea turtle eggs, you can let somebody for eating sea turtle eggs. But all you're going to do is upset the entire community. So they said, no, no, we're going to sit down with the community and say, oh, maybe you can harvest some of the eggs. Or how, how can we work this out so, you know, we can have coexistence? And so that, yes, I pick a club that the community believes in of a very powerful law. And the Endangered Species Act in the U.S. is a perfect example. Very powerful law. What's happened? It's the people that believe in it are going like this because people are being hit over the head with it and they don't like it. And so the politics is, is that law could never be passed again in the United States because of all the, all the anger that it's created. Hi. It's a, it was a wonderful talk and I agree with everything that you have said in the talk. Uh, but I'm just going to add one more facet to what Chetan was saying that, you know, when we, like, I work with frogs, okay, and they are, you don't have any value in the communities for frogs because they're ugly, okay? So <laughs> nobody wants to value that. But if you have a legal backing to save frog, like we have to save the tiger for now, then there are certain values that change with science, right? Like you provide a background that, okay, this is probably giving some kind of a service or like if you save biodiversity, then it adds to like say quality of life. Uh, because in India, we deal with this problem where, uh, and this is coming from like my uh, field experience where I went and I said to the community that, oh, I want to see this frog in, in this community, okay? And they said, madam, we don't have water to drink. Like, what are you talking about? You know, we don't want to see this frog. So that's where I believe that, of course, there is awareness. And of course, there's like a problem with the very powerful laws that come up. But I think when, um, when we're dealing with like, the absolute basics and the community doesn't have those basics, then it's harder to like promote a kind of a model like that you were saying, right? Mm -hmm. Then we need to tackle the basics first and then come up with the law that supports those values. And then there is a lot of building of those values that takes place. That's only, uh, yeah. if I'm understanding correctly, 
the change in values has to come before the law. You can't use the law to change the values. If you pass a law that the people resent, you know, every, every frog in the world in, in India must be saved or something like that, and they'll be punished if you kill a frog, and the community doesn't believe it, it's not going to be an effective law, and people will resent it. The challenge is, and I agree with you 100%, how do you get a community that doesn't care about frogs to do anything to conserve them, right? That's the real issue. The, the solution to that is not an easy solution, but there is a solution. And, and that is, gee, what are the stakeholder groups in my community that if we influence, will conserve frogs? And I can tell you right away what the like, like answer to that is. Little kids. If I, if I were in that situation, I'd develop a program for the youngest kids in school, and I try to get them out to see frogs and understand frogs and read what a tadpole is and how incredible the emphasis is and that type of thing. And they're going to go home and say, I'm, geez, I, these tadpoles are unbelievable, you know, that kind of thing. And so young children will end up being an absolutely fundamental stakeholder for everything, especially when the community does not have but the kind of ethics that you think it ought to have. But that's where the answer is going to be. It is not going to be through legislation or legislation with teeth or new law enforcement. Like what I was saying is, isn't it easier that we have a law that protects some sure. sort of a habitat and then that habitat in itself protects the frog? And of course, I'm, I'm not saying that you should restrict people from entering that area or like restrict use of that area. But I'm saying that if you have anything that is trickling from up and that if a politician recognizes that oh this habitat has to be protected then maybe that could be you know a way of dealing with like a lot of the biodiversity that we don't see and then that will be conserved well what i'm saying is that that sounds like the easy solution but when you think about it it doesn't work <laughs> because i i can't tell you how many different laws i've worked with and we could sit and talk about different laws and how they failed or succeeded, but it generally does not work because what generally happens with laws like the one we're talking about is that if the law has teeth and says, you do, you kill a frog, you pay a penalty, that is not going to convert a community to saving frogs. It is going to create a hostility toward frog. We're going to kill the frogs anyway, except, you know, they, it, it, no one's going to know it. And it will get you nothing. And uh, it'll be a law that's just paper. You know, we have laws in the United States which, you know, Joe Walking, do you have Joe Walking here? You know, you can't cross the street except at the corner. Nobody does that. There are laws everywhere against Joe Walking. Everybody jaywalks because no one believes in it. And if they had a big penalty every once in a while, some city decides to create a fine for jaywalking, they're crazy. You know, because it just riles up the whole populace. So, you're right. You're absolutely right. Is it, it's easy, and that's why we've done it forever. We say, "Oh, if we create a powerful law, that will give us progress." But it's not going to give you progress. What it's going to give you, you're going to spend years trying to get the law passed. Then the law is going to get washed. You know, the, the language is going to get washed down because you know there's conflict over the law. Then they finally pass the law. There's no need to implement the law, right? And, and so they have no enforcement. And we're spending all this energy. Uh, in creating the law and implementing the law. And, uh, you know, 10 years went past. And by the time those 10 years went past, the community's values have probably gone down the tubes because they're starting to, you know, everybody wants the Western reason and, and all this kind of stuff. So, uh, you know, like I said, it's not easy. It's what's been done forever. It doesn't work. Taking from both the questions that were asked earlier, uh, don't you think putting the uh, burden of conservation on people that still hold cultural values of conservation is also becomes kind of unfair? Because uh, if there is a community that is tolerant towards probably having their crops raided or being attacked, uh, as opposed to another that is not tolerant to it, and then there is definitely like an uh, equity issue here of economic well-being. Then how do you kind of tackle 
both these situations and take conservation forward. You said, is it unfair? That's your asking? Yes. Oh, absolutely. Sure. Because some people have a big sacrifice, right? And it's all about sacrifice. So if you want to measure how successful conservation is, it's not by hundreds of hectares of protected areas you set aside. It is not by how powerful the law is that you passed. It is not by how many law enforcement officers you hired. It's about what is the sacrifice that a community is willing to make to save a frog or to save biodiversity. And you're right. It's not fairly, it's not equitably distributed in the population. That's that's absolutely true. And you know, that's a really interesting question. How do you make it fairer? But the real way you can make it fairer is to try to get the other communities that aren't making any sacrifice whatsoever to try to make a sacrifice by getting them to understand how important it is to have values that conserve the resource, conserve, conserve living things. In fact, it was frankly, it was making a sacrifice for the whole world. Because I can tell you, tigers would not exist. Why is it that India has more than half of the tigers of the world? Because the other countries of the world have not made the sacrifice that India has made. Oops. Thank you. What a follow-up question you would like. <laughs> okay, thanks. Uh, I think, uh, the, you know, I think, uh, We've had a very long, very interesting uh, session. And like I said, master students, uh, PhD students also, I think you will engage with the hub on Monday. Uh, mm -hmm. You have a day long seminar, right? So you can discuss these in more detail. And hub is around and uh, I will pass on his email so you can engage with him when he's in campus. You can write to him and we can. And, and, and I was telling you, I'm going to bring him back maybe next year, <laughs> you know, during some appropriate coursework semester and we can have him teach also but yeah right so you can always engage with him tomorrow day after this week yeah thanks thanks, thanks. Sure. 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 Sure.